Okay. All right, everyone who is here already, we're going to jump in. Hopefully we'll have more people um, uh, jumping in as we go, but we're starting with who we have. Um, and today I really want it to be interactive. So if you have got something right now that is bringing you listing appointments, is bringing you listing leads, say, you know, raise your hand or just start talking and share it. Um, because I do know nearly all of you are um, getting uh, listings right now in what has been a unquestionably um, difficult market. Um, I am going to start off with a couple of key items that coaches have been talking about. I really only want to share a couple of things and then I want to hear from you. Um, the theme of this invite extraordinary agents going to extraordinary measure. So I want to encourage all of us to put on our thinking on a really grand scale hats. Um, and, you know, just think outside of the box. Uh, Rebecca, you and I talked the other day about that concept of 20 ways, 20 ways to hit a goal. And I'm hoping we can do that together today. Meaning by the end of this meeting, I hope we've got 20 measurable, smart goal style actions that people, you guys can take with you. And it will be ways to fill your pipeline and ways to get listings. Okay. So the couple things, again, I'm just going to share like three little things right off the top, and then I'm turning it over to all of you. So start thinking about your absolute best ideas for getting listings. Um, one is you're going to want to either um, expand your area geographically. So this is a time and this is a market where, um, you know, say th three years ago, you may not have driven 45 minutes for a listing. Now is the time, especially if it's in your price point and your wheelhouse. And I'm saying that because I'm looking down this list. You guys know I coach a lot of luxury agents. You may drive further if it's a motivated, qualified seller, right? So, you know, I would encourage everyone that is on this call or listening to this recording, sit down, you know, put on the Doobie Brothers, turn off your phone, have a map, Look at where you typically do business and then just draw a circle about 10 more minutes out and see what's there. So um, I'm not going to go into too much more detail about that. Just consider, is this the time to spread out geographically, particularly for motivated sellers and the right price point? I'm going to say usually the answer is yes. Okay. Uh, that is something that on our coaching calls, if you have a concern about well, you know, I'm up against a local, I'm whatever. Just we'll talk about it on your coaching calls and we can figure out the scripting and the preparation that will still put you, make you the right choice. Uh, next thing I'm going to say, um, this is absolutely the time where we want to set your world up to completely be focused on listings, listing appointments, listing pipeline, listing process, pre-listing package, everything listings. I hope I'm getting the point across by saying listing one more time. What I mean by that is this would be a great time for every single one of you. And I coach some listing wizards and I'm including you in this to start practicing your listing presentation every day. Even if you take that script and you take 15 minutes after lunch to go into your car or the bathroom and read the whole thing right out loud. That's gonna activate your RAS, it's gonna sharpen your skills, and it's gonna keep you absolutely on your A game. That's our equivalent of going to the driving range and the putting green. If you wanna get better at golf, you better be there every day, right, doing it. So I'm gonna encourage all of you, break out that script. I am gonna, I don't gamble. If I did, I would bet $10 that um, a lot of you have probably not read through your listing presentation word for word in a while. If you did a 30 day challenge, boom, I, I think that would be incredible. The second component to having that incredible focus on um, listings, mm. use your buyer's agents. Um, so, uh, I, and of course you all know me. So there's always a select group. I shouldn't say always. Usually there's a select group 
of buyers that you reserve the right to work with. Tighten those boundaries. Um, start thinking to yourself, not which buyers will you work with, start thinking which buyers meet the incredibly high boundaries and professional standards I've set to myself where I may choose to represent them as a buyer, A. So see how that's a shift? It's not which ones are you gonna keep, but which ones earn the right for you to work with them. And then even when you've decided that, I want you to stop yourself again and say, is it in the best interest of this buyer for them to work with me? Or would they be better represented by my buyer's agent, right? And just really think it through. If that's a conversation we should have, let me know. Um, if you don't have buyer's agents, because um, I do love solo agents. That's one of my subspecialties. I have a lot of you that are solo agents with staff. This is a great time to set up a standing referral agreement. Tell your productivity coach and your team leader that you are looking for two dynamic agents that are newer in the business that would like to be on a standing referral agreement between now and Labor Day. And they will be working with some of your buyer leads um, and set that up. So if you're a solo agent and you don't have a buyer's agent, get someone that you can refer buyers to. Now in that instance, of course, and, and we can clarify this on your coaching call, you're gonna keep your sphere of influence or past clients. I'm talking internet leads, open houses, things like that, okay? But just this is the time between, you know, where you've got to get your mindset activated and on alert for any and all listings, okay? Um, then the, the last little thing, and then over to you, absentee owners can be so critical right now. And I know that depending on your MLSs and your different market areas, we may have access to information and in some places we will not. If you're in an area where rentals are in the MLS, get someone on your team pulling up all the properties that went under lease in August and September of last year. And let's start a campaign now with the owners of those properties. Um, absentee owners on houses that are not rentals. If you can talk to your title rep and see which ones are truly second homes, let's get in communication with those people. If we could set up a, I'm gonna say eight by eight, but a summer campaign that would go to those absentee owners, it is highly possible that that could lead to some additional listings as well, okay? So um, there's more to do with absentee owners and we can talk about that more. At this point though, I really want to turn this over to all of you and I want you all to share what are you doing right now on a big scale to really attract seller leads, uncover listing opportunity and fill your pipeline. You said on a high level, Bridget. So I'm not doing things on a high level, obviously, right now since I'm recovering. Right. But um, one of the things that I'm focusing on is when I when we have buyers. And by the way, full transparency, I really I'm not showing sure houses. I have a showing assistant that I have a standing referral agreement with, so it's just been great. Um, when we have a, a buyer that puts an offer in and likes the neighborhood, we're actually creating a drafted letter that we send out to that neighborhood. Um, to say that we have a buyer looking. Even if we get them on the contract, we'll still send a letter out because then people might still call us and we can go ahead and get the listing for it. Bingo. So to recap that, to make sure you all heard it, when they have buyers for a hot neighborhood and the right price point area where they want to do more business, they're actually sending out, I have a buyer letters to that whole neighborhood. And that is uncovering some, because we all know even in this tight market, when one listing goes on, within the next three months, there is usually one or two more. In a, in a more normal market, there's usually two or three more. Um, so by doing that, Natalie's able to uncover some other neighbors that may potentially want to sell. And I also thought about sending a secondary letter on the ones that we have some buyers that are willing to pay, you know, a significant amount of, about the price value and it's pushing the prices up in the neighborhood. And we're actually considering sending a card or a letter stating, hey, our buyer just bought in there. And yes, they love the neighborhood that much that they paid X amount. And now your home might be worth X amount more. If you're interested in, in, in a cash amount on your equity, let us know. So I'm not sure if anybody's done that yet, but because that becomes a new comp. Right. That's so right. 
Right. Yeah. So um, sending out to a neighborhood where you had a buyer, which I love this, Natalie, because it's a concept. That's how creative we have to get. We have to think about, we have these buyer clients and buyer deals. How do we get listings from it? Um, so sending out that letter after closing of, wow, a new comparable has been set to find out what your home is worth. Please reach out right now with a strong call to action um, is excellent. And it's a perfect marriage with the, I have a buyer letter. And then the, you know, what's the value of your home now that your neighbor sold at X value. So that is that very I'm just going to kind of chime in on that um, because that's similar to what I'm I'm doing because we just had a listing. Um, I sent 385 letters to that neighborhood um, because it is a hot neighborhood. Um, we are now just about to send up a follow up postcard, and then because of where I was able to pull the data for the owners and, and a lot were absentee owners as well. Um, we have emails. Okay. So we're going to follow up then with an email um, giving them some more specific information. Okay. Um, Delisa, what if someone gets upset that you sent them an email and they unsubscribe? And I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the last part. And they unsubscribe. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No one cares. Move on. No one cares, right? So no, it doesn't matter. Other people then. I mean. Right. Yeah. It's better to get, my point with that is excellent. You've got ability to get emails, send the emails out. Um, sometimes agents hesitate and they're like, oh, well, you know, I don't know if I should just send it, just send it. If they unsubscribe, it doesn't matter. Um, we need to remember in this market and we need to take on the mindset. I don't ask they can't say yes. So keep asking and ask more and more people. Um, you know, you could actually work that into your morning affirmation routine. Man, I ask anyone and everyone what they want to do in real estate because if I don't ask that I can't say yes. I'm giving them an opportunity to say yes to me. All right. So that, again, that's a great um, opportunity. What service did you use, Delisa, where you were able to get the addresses, the absentee information, and some emails? Remind. Perfect. Okay. So I know a lot of you guys, how many of you use Remind? Quick show of hands. Yeah. So, you know, make sure you're familiar with what they offer and what you can do and then maximize what you do on there. What else can we do? Yes, Patty. Patty, where'd she go? And hold on. Oh, there you are. Uh, can you hear me? We can, and tell everyone okay. where you're from. I forgot Sorry. to tell Natalie and Delisa to say that. Yeah, um, we're from uh, Carmel, Indiana. Uh, we're, and we do use that. Um, currently, we also we just we just got our luxury certification, so we're just starting to vamp up our program. But we're still doing the blank check program. Um, we are we are sending out buyer letters. Um, the other thing that we did was I did a banner across our website that um, is identifying those campaigns: the blank check, the what's your home worth program, and to. Um, encourage them to reach out to us. We also um, just put together a luxury brochure that we're using to, um, when we have a luxury partner that we're trying to get their business. And so there's a lot of things that we're just now starting to do, but we're, we're vamping that part of it up pretty heavily. And the other thing that we're doing that we added was our, we put together a whole relocation guide for, um, because we have a concierge program and we're just trying to pad it every way we can and have resources available to those hiring clients so that they don't have to do anything. Right, right. So, and, and, and Patty, if it's okay, I wanna take all that you shared and consolidate it down. So essentially, sure. Patty, who um, works on Zulu Group and Carmel's a very nice area, Carmel Fishers, right outside Indianapolis, 
what she's done, essentially what I'm hearing you say, Patty, is get your pre-listing package together. If you need a luxury one, make a luxury one. If you need one for investors, make one for, you know, so get your marketing materials together, get them where they are deliverable, and then figure out how you can deliver it to more people right now. And that's what Patty's actively doing. So in, for example, she gave the luxury uh, brochure. They're sending that out to people in their database with homes of high net worth uh, or high assessed value. So like create the materials and get the materials out and then take advantage of what's available to you on your website so that the messaging on your website coincides with the message that you're sending by email on social media and on your phone calls and have that sort of reinforcement of the theme. Two okay. other things. Two Is other things, things Bridget. Can you consolidate that well, Patty? Yes. And two other things that we're doing just to mention is um, I know Kylie is going in and pulling expireds and looking at those to see if they match what our buyers are needing. So we're, I mean, everybody on the team is working to obtain the same goal and get that done. And then the other thing that Steve and I have been doing is we are meeting with vet vendors or partners that we know that already work with high-end clients and saying, look, this is what we have to offer. How can we work together? So we're opening ourselves up to their database as well. Which is incredible. And again, that's using those materials. So get materials together. Um, you know, if uh, just don't overthink it, it's not the time for overthinking. This is a time where, of course, you want it to look great and sound great. It's not the time to, you know, even though this is funny because I did talk to Patty about one of her font sizes, but like, don't get all wrapped up in the small details. Get it done, have it be good enough, and let's get it out in front of people on a grand scale. Um, you know, what she shared about having intentional strategic meetings with all of your vendors. That is so critical right now. And I know that on a lot of calls, we talk about this. This is a time where you need to have coffee or a face-to-face -face, if possible with your core vendors. And you need to say to them, you know what? We are capturing so much of this market. I wanna do more business with you before the end of the year. And we have a goal of blank number of listings taken in the next 60 days. Who do you know that I should be talking to right now? And with that level of specificity, who do you know that I should know? Who can I be talking to right now? And giving that goal that's immeasurable. We are taking 14 listings in the next 60 days. I would love for one of those 14 to be someone important to you. Who can I talk to right now? Do you see how that's a lot different than, hey, you know, we're always looking for business. If you know anyone, let me know. What? Okay. That's a fart in a tornado. No one's going to pay attention to that. Okay. That'll be the great thing I say all day. Um, Rebecca, what are you going to share? That was hilarious. Thank you for making me laugh. Um, okay. Three things. I just looked back over the pipeline. So it's a little cheesy and a little corny. However, one of the ways that we, oh, what just happened? Um, on, let me stop uh, sharing for a second. Can you see? There we go. Okay, so it says, here's my first sale sign, and it says nine offers, it's the lighting, sorry guys. The lighting's weird. Um, it says nine, nine offers, eight buyers still looking, um, will you sell yours, call me. Like super cheesy, I call this my sunburst sign, and I've had just like corrugated plastic, nothing fancy, um, got these sunburst signs put together because one of the things I found is I'd be getting buyer calls off of that. And then sellers would be like, well, hang on. If there's eight people still looking in my neighborhood, what do you think I could get for my house? And Can so you that again, can you put it up again? Oh, sure. Um, as a matter of fact, Rebecca, could you share that uh, template with us? So I literally, like, if you just take a picture of that sign, you could make it a circle, you could make it a star, like right. just your local sign company, 
that um, it's, and I mean, this was like maybe 40 bucks and then we just staple it to the post. And I know (laughs) post and signs are different everywhere, but come up with a a land um, or what the little stick in the ground sign and do the same thing. Um, But just how do you make your phone ring with future sellers? That's one of them. And then the other thing is that we're hosting regular downsizing workshops as well as baby steps to investing in real estate workshops because what happens from the investing standpoint is they realize they either need to downsize and sell to position themselves to purchase the multifamily or the whatever they're looking to do next. So the people in our pipeline have have come um, from there and then referrals. So who are my feeder markets? Mm-hmm. And being very strategic that I like, you know, connect with them and K-Dub connect referrals and then like them on Facebook, like their business page and just go, okay, I'm going to be intentional in the next 30 days. I want to find, my intention is to find a referral for this agent. Right. And you activate your RAS and then it's so funny how often it it actually happens. Mm -hmm. Do you have one more? Sunburst signage, downsizing workshops, and investing. Oh, baby steps to investing. Okay. And the referrals and the feeder markets, and really being okay. purposeful about the migration patterns function in the KDUB command referrals screen when you go yeah. to the Grow My Network and then do that um, inbound and outbound. Uh huh. And then it shows like, you know, where, and so it's like, okay, yeah, I've got to be friends with people here because of the military base. So then I can call and it's not just this random call. It's, Hey, Bridget, you live near Fort Bragg and I live near, you know, JBLM. And so, and I'm just saying it out loud so that you remember that this is something we could potentially partner together in. Right. Well, the more you reach out to agents, you're actually planting the seed in their mind that they will also have a referral for you. Um, you know, Rebecca, you bring up a great point because I know I talked to you guys about reach out and call other agents. Um, Brady Sandall, who's now the new head of KW Luxury for years, he's called five out of area agents every workday. And he just does it. He just does it without, you know, there's no question or overthinking or who's going to, he just does it. And that has built a tremendous referral business for him in Coachella Valley, uh, Palm Desert, Palm Springs area of California. Um, you know, that th- what you said though, Rebecca, that takes it to that next level. So this is what makes it extraordinary. You're not just calling an agent near, I think you said Fort Bragg, you're calling knowing about why they might have people there and knowing why they might be moving to your area by saying the JBLM or JBML, you know, plant is there in your town. <laughs> So when you, that's one of the things about extraordinary measures. When you add in specifics, you get bigger results. So being specific with those agents, being specific in your, I have a buyer letters. When you add in specifics, you get higher engagement. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, You guys know me really well. (laughs) Usually if someone says, I'm going to do this bit of research before I make a call. Uh, you all could answer for me. I usually go, no, no research before calls. You just get on the phone. I will say when you're calling out of area agents, that is a moment that makes sense. Okay. Um, so thank you for all of those, Rebecca. Um, who else has um, things that, uh, someone, Teresa, in the chat, I think you said that uh, you wanted to know if people had talked about command um, postcards. Can you share with that? And then Alicia, we're going to come to you. Sure. Hold on, I don't see where I'm at. Um, I just sent out 300 or 600 for three different neighborhoods of the properties that I've sold in that neighborhood. And it came out to 59 cents per, per postcard. It's stamped, printed, and delivered. So that's super cheap for getting listings, reaching out to all these people. These are not my farm areas. These are areas I just sold a house, either listing or I sold a home. I think that's awesome. And so again, like you may take a different approach with places that are not your typical farm, 
because your farm's probably already on a big campaign, but how easy and inexpensive to, and it's just there and you just do it, right? So I think that's awesome. You could also, I have not yet checked it Bridget, out. You can also do it for, you, you can also do it for your database. Like okay, you can create a postcard for your database and just send it directly to them. Again, printing, that's really cheap. Printing and mailing out is the biggest, you know, the most cost. Right. So Delisa, I'm going to connect you directly with Teresa. I'll send the two of you an email and she can share with you what she did. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and I've done them before. I, I don't know if there was just some glitch in command, but, right, Teresa, right. but you guys can just talk about that off offline. Okay. Um, the, I think the extraordinary measure here is do what you're farming to your farm, get more postcards out to your database and make sure you're sending postcards with the listing opportunities. So what I hear you saying, Teresa, is take every opportunity and get the message out. Um, and we have an inexpensive, yes. yeah, so that's, that's really strong. Um, Alicia, what are you going to share with us? Um, okay, so a couple different things. We are, I had a, um, you know, one of those, <laughs> one of those fun ones where you have buyer and seller under contract in five minutes and that falls through immediately. So um, we are going back on market. We went back on market yesterday and my, talking about leveraging your team, um, my team member is, let's see if I can make this easy for you to see is doing these little postcards that say, hey neighbor, you're invited. They're like little, um, they're almost like an invitation. Sorry, we'll see if you can see them. This is the back side. So here is, here's the front. They just, and they're on um, cardstock that's got a little bit of sheen, just a little bit of info. Right. The back side has our information, mine and my team members plus a QR code that goes to additional information, but also has a lead capture form. Um, and so basically what she's doing is she's a, she's writing a little note on a bunch of them beforehand for people that she doesn't actually talk to, that she's just going to door knock and stick it in the door that says something like, hope you can make it, and then signs right. her name. And then for people that she actually talks to, you know, she can hand the pre-done ones or people that if she can make a personalized note, something like, you know, I love your flowers or your wreath looks so cute or whatever, something to that extent. And then afterwards, anyone she had conversations with, she can go back through and send personal note cards to. And then obviously we'll see who attends and then go back through, mark those people so that we can do additional just sold. Here's how many offers we had, if we can get phone numbers from them, whatever kind of information. But basically the script is something to the extent of you're invited, you know, we would love for you to attend and have the opportunity to pick your neighbor, that kind of thing. Um, right. So she's right. doing that for four hours today and four hours in the morning of the open house on Sunday. That's um, so that's one little piece for, I kind of forgot about circle prospecting and I was talking to another team, another gal with a team in our office and she's like, why aren't you doing that? So that is our, we're starting that. Um, something else that is newer in our office that we're getting going in, um, I'm working on opening the lecture division in the Aspen Valley in Colorado, um, is called, we're calling it the slasher program. This is something that my, um, my TL in our office had started in California. Um, and basically what it does is the whole concept comes from, you know, someone who's an author slash actor slash attorney slash whatever, not like, I always think of like slasher ridiculous, but, um, Basically, what you do in our area, we have so many people who work in the service industry that have a oh ton my. of contact with high-end luxury clients. Um, and so what you do is you talk to someone who's, for example, a ski instructor in Aspen and say, hey, if you will go through the licensing course and get your real estate license, that's all you have to do. Keep it current. I will allow you to essentially become a part of my team. There are some... And basically, they're, we don't advertise anything for them, but we brand materials for them. So they can send us referrals. They get 25% of every transaction all day long. So that way, I mean, for some of these ski instructors, they're going to make more of 25% of a sale of a home in Aspen than they will all year. So right. 
that is a huge, huge opportunity for them to say, you know what, because this is my day job and I'm here during the day, I'm not as available. I'm going to refer you to my team and they're fabulous. I'll still be here as a resource, but basically we take over, they just collect checks. Um, so that's something, and these are all, you're talking about what's working well. I'm like, these are all in process. So that's, okay. uh, just, that's part of this too. We want to brainstorm. Just some ideas. Um, the third thing that we are doing as well is in our area, um, we have the Aspen Valley that goes to almost to the Utah border. And then we have the Vail Valley and they're two separate MLSs, which is kind of funny because people look on both sides. So I know that in larger cities, a lot of times MLSs are very small areas. So kind of as we were talking about it earlier with expanding, what yeah. we're doing specifically is we're targeting agents in our MLS because no one, to my knowledge, almost no one is licensed, um, not as licensed, but has their MLS on both halves of the Valley. They're only in ours. So we're saying, hey, I've worked with you on X amount of deals. I have so much respect for you. I will give you 30% to give me all of your referrals for the other half of the Valley. If this person ends up buying here, absolutely it goes back to you, but let me be your referral source because you trust me, we've worked together. Of course, this is your lead if it's in our Valley that you're in right now, but if they buy on the other half, I'll take care of them. So really targeting even outside of our, not just in our office, but all the agents that are within our MLS that I've worked with in the past. And, you know, I think you're right, Alicia, that fits in with expanding your area geographically and getting more creative with it. Um, you know, so when you do that invitation, um, you could also, and I have a couple of clients that have done this in the past, when you see that someone in the one MLS has a particularly luxury listing or high price listing that is actually located on the other side of the valley, you can call and say, you know, for 5%, I'll go ahead and put it in the other MLS. Oh, and, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, some did five, some did 10. You don't want to make it too big. Otherwise, it's not appealing. Uh, but what you ask for is if I can put it in the MLS and if I can have marketing rights. So then you have the opportunity to also promote that listing. Um, you know, so that's what we're talking about today is like, because we all know. So even that, even if you get 5%, it is a high end listing under your name in your MLS. And that leads to market data and market share. And your chance of actually finding a buyer for that property increased dramatically if you have that little bit of skin in the game, you know, to, to get that sold. Um, Absolutely. I would, you know, I wouldn't be doing that on um, below average sales price properties. I don't think it would be worth your work. Right. All right. Well, good. I love that. The slasher program is pretty exciting. Um, and it's funny because slasher, account, slasher program is actually counter to what we would usually recommend. How many of you on this call have said to me, I'm thinking about hiring this agent, but they're part-time and they have a full-time job. And what is my very first answer before you finish saying it? No, don't do it, right? But slasher is looking for, and Alicia, I think what's critical with the slasher program is like the example of the ski instructor or somebody who works at an iconic steakhouse or an incredible um, uh, um, stylist or uh, salon. I can't think of the word. I'm having tip of the tongue syndrome. The people that cut our hair. Um, <laughs> so if, if it's someone like that, think about everyone they are in touch with. A ski instructor in Aspen, are they dealing with people with money every dang day that might just want to get that really nice second home that's not even a vacation rental in the Valley? Yes, right? So the slasher program is very appealing and I like the creativity of thinking about that. And it doesn't have to just be in the service industry. You know, we're working on moving this into divorce attorneys, mm -hmm. um, creating packages for them or working, you know, just where are those people, financial planners, where are people that can really get a benefit? And in the service industry, there is definitely a monetary kind of excitement right. because of yeah. the fact that they know this can give them the best of both worlds. They can still be a raft guide in the summer and a ski instructor in the winter and make a right. ton of money. But you could use it across so many platforms with your vendors, too. It'd be a great vendor conversation. Right. 
That's exactly right. And then you build in a little bit more loyalty, you know, with them. So, and it could be open or it could be confidential. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's all. Yeah. Just make sure it's all in alignment with anything with your poor dear broker of record because, you know, different states have different uh, situations. So always yeah. run something like that past them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, DJ, I think I saw you pop on the call. So DJ and I were having an interesting conversation and DJ, I'd like your ideas as well. But one of the things that um, we talked about the other day is what would happen if you just added in one additional hour of lead generation four days a week. And this literally I'm saying to every single one of you. So regardless of how much you lead generate right now, um, you know, so if you're someone who's already on the phone two and a half hours a day, what happens if four days a week you're on for four and a half hours? If you're someone that's already doing a big business and you're only making about maybe 45 minutes of intentional calls three days a week, I have a few of you. Um, what would happen if you added in four intentional strategic appointment setting lead generation hours every week? And I'm asking you all, do you think you would have more listings and do you think you would do more business? And would you have more leads to give your buyer agents if you have buyer agents? For sure. Um, can you hear me, by the way? Yes. Yeah. So for me, um, I, I'll find a million excuses why not to do that, <laughs> like most of us. Um, but also for me, we're making a high, we made a hire yesterday that's going to enable me to do this, which is to hire a listing coordinator. Because yeah. as the rainmaker and the owner of the business and part marketing person, a little too many hats that I wear running around and picking up. So what I had done was I, I took your advice and I sat down for the week and I wrote down everything I do for the week, for the yeah. last two weeks. And anything that was not dollar generating, I was trying to find a solution for, whether it was an outside vendor I could hire, whether it was something I could put under the job rule, job description for listing coordinator. Mm -hmm. So purely having this listing coordinator is gonna free up a tremendous amount of my time that I could do a lot of things with, most of which should be put into dollar generating lead gen opportunities. Right. And, you know, DJ, total play on words here, which was not set up beforehand. But when you say you'll find a million reasons to not do it, we need to shift your focus to a million reasons to do it. And it would be an additional million dollars in income. So Absolutely. you start thinking and maybe even print that out, you know, four additional hours of lead generation every week equals a million bucks GCI. Have I done the math? No, but, you know, I can. And make sure you're keeping that on your radar screen. So if I could steal something from the team, from the group here, um, one thing we started doing or we're planning to start doing at the beginning, right when COVID started last year was along the lines of one of the previous people who spoke with the little mailers they're sending out around their open houses. Mm -hmm. We were gonna do these VIP seller booklets for the 10 homes around the open houses and the new listings that we have coming on the market. Instead of certain, in, in addition to or instead of circle prospecting phone calls, which we didn't have a high yield on in the past, but we were in a door knock and hand these seller folders over to the sellers who live in the homes next door to them. And in that packet, what I'm hoping to get some feedback from the group is what if anyone does this, do they include in those folders? And if you don't and you're brainstorming right now with me, what else would you include? So for us, what we're doing right now is our pre-listing packet or seller guide. Um, some examples of our marketing materials, a list of our vetted vendor list, a ROI renovation guide. So what your return on investment is for all the different projects you're doing in the house. And that's kind of where we left it. And we're open to other suggestions. So is anybody doing anything different or have good suggestions? Yeah, we did something similar. We partnered with Michael Lewis Marketing. Um, my assistant created and designed it in um, Canva and then sent it to them so that they could look at it with that marketing eye. And one of the bits of feedback they gave us was to make it evergreen, like that timeless, because if you're going to spend that kind of money on a high gloss, like really good quality, something that you're giving, you've got to make it last. And so we had to go back and kind of revamp everything we did the testimonials. We said like, we've got our, um, you know, our favorites list of vendors. We did all these things, however, made it as evergreen and timeless as possible so that it, we, it would last and we could do a massive bulk order and then not be mad that it looks dated, you know, three months right. from now. Right. 
you know, so you want to make sure that uh, to give you an example of what she's talking about, you don't want to say for the past five years, we blah, blah, blah. You want to say since 1998, we have because the year, right? right? So you, you don't want anything that's going to get out of time. And then the items that are time sensitive um, would be an, a letter that's on top, you know, like, you know, it'll be multiple items within the package. Um, the one thing I'll say, DJ, is um, especially, so this is very, this is like taking the three, three and seven, but making it like five, five, 10, or, you know, the people, immediate neighbors. If you can set it up where you can um, make the letter that's included personalized to them, that makes it better. So right. if it says actually, you know, DJ and Nikki, uh, you know, or Mr. and Mrs. Ten Hove, uh, you know, so if you can personalize that letter to them, that's better. And you can make more of the timely information be in that cover letter that's in the package. Got it. Um, you know, and, and by the way, last thing I want to say on it, make it about them. So, it, you know, it, it, the more you make it about them. So as a neighbor of one, two, three Primrose, this sale is going to impact the value of your home. And that's why we're reaching out to you in this dedicated way, because we understand that. And we want you to know that it is our intention to create an incredible, comparable and protect and, you know, the values in your neighborhood. So you got to make it about them, not about the house and not about the sellers. Um, you will be, you know, and then have a plan, sorry. So you want to have a plan where they get that package ideally before the sign even goes up, if you're allowed to do that in your area, um, or at least right when the sign goes up. And then you want to have a follow-up. So they get something when it goes under contract. They get something when it's the special neighbor preview or the open house. They get something if, uh, you know, heaven forbid, there's a price reduction. Um, you know, they would get that. And then, of course, you want them to be one of the absolute first to know right when it closes. So you want to have a smaller scale yet still high-end package that is literally ready to go the minute you have confirmation of closing that is just like boom dropped on their porches okay um it. It, it's some people have taken that type of program and they've really upped it especially in luxury or higher price point and they've done things like ordered beautiful high-end almost portfolio style envelopes or, you know, they put it in, um, one lady I used to coach in Northern California actually got these very high-end boxes, you know, like a streamlined, beautiful box they could actually reuse, you know, and you, know, you open it up and the information's in there. So on the higher price point and luxury, this is a place, and you guys know I don't like spending money, uh, but that's a place where that spend is probably worth it because it's going to stand out. It's going to cause you to stand out from the crowd with a captive audience because it, you do have that listing right beside them. Uh, and I have a couple of things I would recommend putting in there. Mm -hmm. um, so like I have a program called Improve and Move. So when you're giving them out, you just don't know if the house is updated or not. And you know, if you don't have that, basically my vendors will do the renovations on it and the seller pays at closing, right? And and so I have a flyer that my marketing uh, person created. So, I, you know, if you have something like that, if you don't, you know, Keller Williams has the concierge program. The other form I would add, probably add is I created, uh, she also created a six options to move. And in that is Keller offers the move and improve program, but then I have another flyer that talks about it more. I can bring you an investor that can buy it. Uh, you know, sell it in the open market. All the different options that they have are spelled out on there. So when they see it, they already see that you have a lot of resources. You're not just thinking about putting a sign out in the yard and that's it. That's right. Yeah. That's the same. That's great. Thing. How do you find contractors willing to get paid at closing? <laughs> uh, you moved to Atlanta, DJ. <laughs> you know what, though? It's, uh, call me, DJ. I'll tell you how I kind of went about it. I have two contractors now. I do it, but we only do it to a certain amount. But I, we can have off, offline talk about okay, it. Okay, I'll call you offline. Yeah. yeah. And then I think Brenda Piper, I think you're on here. Weren't you sort of uh, bringing up the KW ready to sell? Yeah, I just got certified in that. So I'm wondering how people are using that besides just sending out flyers. 
Uh, Piper, I would love to know what the fees are because when I looked at some of those programs that we have here that are third party programs, they were basically pricing everything up almost three times the cost. It just didn't make sense. That's why I went to my vendors and it's been good. We've done five last year that way. Good question. So I think that's one we can add to the list is concierge level services slash contractors to get the property ready or ready to sell. Um, you know, I, I think that that's, uh, that's going to become more important um, as we go through this, this market dynamic that's not letting up anytime soon. There's another thing too, Bridget, that I've, I've now doing because of the area I'm moving to is tried a lot of renovations, new builds, things like that. It's going through quite a bit of gentrification. I'm actually going out there when I'm in the neighborhood and talking to the people that are renovating it and creating a relationship because I'm going after the investors right now that have agents that are not really marketing it pro properly. Um, like you don't even know that it's listed or it's, it's going to come available because the market is moving so fast that they're leaving a lot of money on the table by working with inexperienced agents. So creating a relationship and showing value to investors in the area that I'm moving to. Okay. All right. That sounds really good. So I want to give you guys a power question. Does anyone else have their hands up? I think you guys, so I want, I want to give you all a question that you can write down. You could put this at your next team meeting. You could bring it up with your ALC. However you want to use it, use it, put it in front of you. So right now, like if the commissioner for your department of real estate came to your office and said, you've got to take 10 listings in the next 30 days or you're losing your license forever. What would you do every day for the next 30 days? Ooh. Where would you find 10 listings to protect your real estate license, which essentially is a winning lottery ticket and you're just deciding whether you're cashing it in every day, right? So right now, when I say that to you guys, if you don't take 10 listings in the next 30 days, your license is gone forever. What is, I wanna go rapid fire through. What would you do you're given that scenario. You've got 30 days to get 10 listings. What are you going to do? Oh, I don't like you, Bridget. Ooh. I would stay at home and work in quietness in my home but rather than going in the office where the distractions are. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to interpret that as you would protect your bunker and your lead generation and you would make things. Exactly. Right? Okay. Yes. That's exactly. Good. What else? Come on, no one wants to lose their listing, their license. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the circle prospecting where I've had um, my last couple of listings and, and literally pound the, pound the pavement. Okay. Uh, so and not stop until I get those listings. All right, so you would do circle prospecting over the phone and door knocking, and you just wouldn't stop. Uh, Dana, it looks like you're door knocking every day. Yeah, start to I would ramp up. I would ramp up my social media around listings. Okay, and that's from Denise Edwards. You would ramp up your uh, social media and have consistency, have it out there, and just really get that at a high level. What else? And big from every angle. <laughs> I love that. I don't know if you guys heard that. She said, I think you've given me everything you want packed. I would do a reverse bold. Oh, good. Uh, would you do one reverse bold or do like numerous? Numerous. Yeah, what would happen if in the next four weeks? You did a bold 100 or a reverse bold every week for the next four weeks. So that to me, that also is lumped under extraordinary increase in lead generation, right? Uh, Patty, you have your hand up? Yeah, I would say that we'd be hitting it from every angle we could hit it. The phones would be going and social media be hitting it. I mean, every we'd be pulling every tool out of the box that we had. Okay, so just really making sure, and I'm gonna interpret that as an, inc an increased focus on income producing activity every single day, um, looking at all of your main lead sources. Absolutely. Natalie? All my whole database. 
Call your whole database? How about this? Uh, let me preface this with, in the states and areas where you're allowed to do this, okay? Because you're not allowed to do it everywhere. Let's say you have a database with 4,200 people in it. What if you did a slide broadcast and you dropped a casual voice message into 4,200 mailboxes and then handled what comes back and what comes in and just sent it out to your whole database? Again, where you're allowed to do that. Please double check with your broker because some places you're allowed to and other markets you are not allowed to. But could that, you guys know I like to say stir the pot. Could that stir the pot in a major way? Um, Erin Leff couldn't be on with us today. She is on a guest on a panel today with someone else, much to my chagrin. Um, they send out um, thousands of sly broadcast messages and they do it, um, they have, they're flexible, they're in Texas, so they're allowed to do things we're not allowed to do other places, but they do it not only to their database to invite to events or to just very casual. She leaves messages like this. Hey, it's Aaron over at Moats Team. Please give me a call when you get a chance. That's it, and people call in and they just take it as they come in. Um, they have found they get higher response when it's a very short, casual message like that. Hey, hey. Bridget Stewart, I've got a quick question for you. Give me a call at KW, please, blah, blah, blah. There you go, that's it. Um, they are also allowed to send that to expired listings. But again, that is something that is not allowed everywhere. So please don't run out and say, oh, my maps coach said I could do this without double checking with your broker first, okay? Um, what else? Oh, Patty, you've got your hand up again? Mm. No, okay. All right, who else? Give me another, you're gonna lose your license in 30 days. You don't take 10 listings, what else are you gonna do? I think I would focus on prospecting between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. or 5 p.m. and 7, like in those times where people actually are answering their phones, which doesn't usually work with my schedule. <laughs> Correct. So I'm so excited because I was hoping somebody would say that instead of me. Yes, so there's a fortune made on Tuesday evenings and Thursday evenings in that four to six time range. And so one, you know, like um, Saturday morning. So, ha you ha and by the way, that is not, um, that is in addition to the baseline lead generation that's already being done. So you do your lead generation, however that is in the morning. And then if you just add it in one evening a week and every other Saturday morning, do you think you would have more higher pickup rates and more leads, right? and more yeah. appointments. So brilliant. Thank you for saying that. And Bridget, if I can jump in, I can 120% say that that works. And that's a fact. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. used to have, um, so Brandy and I have known each other for a really long time. And one of our old mentors, um, they used to say, you pay your bills with your lead generation in the morning, you build your wealth with the Tuesday evening and Saturday morning. Uh, and oh, yeah. It, you know, it's a uh, and Saturday needs to be like from 8 to 10 a.m. After 10, you won't reach anyone. Right. That's right. It's amazing how many people will pick it up at 8 o'clock. It is. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's phenomenal. Uh, who else has an idea? Floor time and open houses. Floor time works. Okay. If your market center has floor time, do it. If it doesn't, suggest it with the ALC. If you're in an area where people are like, that doesn't work, have them connect with a market center that does it successfully and let's, you know, follow that model in a way that makes it work. So if it's okay with you guys, because we're coming up on the end of the hour, I want to go rapid fire with a couple of old school things. Um, if that's all right with you guys, just a couple, just kind of like we started with, I shared a couple. So if you really are in one of the tight markets and I'm looking at who's on this call and most of you are, um, you can, you want to increase the number of contacts you're making every week. So, um, and by the way, I don't believe in one size fits all. So some of you make 45, some of you make 120, uh, whatever your number is, it's a time to increase it by a significant margin. So I would not just increase time on task, but I would increase your minimum number of contacts that you're gonna have every week to consider that to be a full work week. Um, you know, so, and we can work that out mathematically on your call coming up this week if you would like. 
Um, the more, I know this is going to sound totally obvious. The more people that you're talking to right now, where you ask oh, if they have a real estate need or they have a referral or they need a referral from one of your sources, the more listings you're going to have. I know that's obvious. I just had to say it. The other thing, um, Saturday mornings. So every other Saturday morning, you could be on the phone and every other Saturday morning, you could go to yard sales and estate sales. I am not a yard sale person. You guys probably won't be surprised by that. That was actually my consequence to myself. If I didn't have 136 contacts by the time I left on Fridays uh, from work, my consequence was I had to go to yard sales, um, which I hate. Uh, and I had to ask for, why are you having a yard sale? Oh, you're moving out of a rental or, oh, you're getting ready to put your house on the market. As painful as it is, you will uncover business. Um, so, you know, look for those things many times, which by the way, I think all of us know we're, we're seeing more, um, dirty and hoarded houses lately than ever before, but many times regular average people will kind of do a mini purge and a yard sale prior to having an agent over to list their home. So if you get on that, you can have, uncover landlords that are about to have a vacant house and you can uncover listing leads. If you love yard sales, double whammy for you. Great. So don't forget, you know, keep an eye out on that. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, and we talked about this at the beginning, really sit down and look at your market and look at the opportunity with absentee owners. And especially look at the opportunity with absentee owners that own multiple properties in your area. You're going to create your own hyper list of um, landlords, because if they own more than four houses or four units, they're probably an investor. And I say that because sometimes people own three houses, but they're not an investor. They inherited one, they got divorced and never sold the house. And, you know, they, they kept their first condo uh, because it wouldn't sell because of uh, the um, tenant to owner ratio. You know, you don't know. If they own three or less, it could just be by coincidence they happen to have those houses. If they own more than four or five, they're an investor. So is it possible that it's time for them to um, consider a 1031 exchange while it's still an option? Is it time for them to acquire more properties? Um, is it time for them to you know, sell the seven and buy a multifamily or an apartment complex? But it, that's gonna be something where, um, that may work for your area. Any of you in a resort area, please look at absentee owners. Oliver Davis down in South Beach has built an incredible amount of business, really marketing consistently to out of area owners of rentals and second homes and consistently takes listings from that group. Um, someone that I used to coach in Atlanta um, does a monthly mailing, uh, Bruce Hardy style. How many of you have seen Bruce Hardy talk where he's like, I copied the people in Phoenix. I literally sent the same mailing every month and built a huge business, right? So she had these postcards that she sent to absentee owners um, all over and just built a huge uh, database. So that's one. Last one I'm gonna spit at you and then we gotta go. Um, don't forget the old expireds. I really cannot even tell you guys. You know that I talk to agents. I have clients in Alaska, Hawaii, Toronto, Miami, and 37 states in between. Um, old expireds are listing right now. I am telling you in the last three weeks, I can't tell you how many in that active pending close chart, old expired, old expired, old expired. The sweet spot seems to be somewhere from about 2013 to 2016. So get someone pulling that data and start, you know, do whatever you need to do to get information, get a mailing to them, find phone numbers and get into communication, send them an equity letter, send them an I have a buyer letter, whatever you can do, do not forget old expires. Even if you don't work fresh expires, a lot of my clients don't work expires. Many of you have relationship and database driven business. Okay. So that's, I'm going to end with that. Any final words? And then we're going to end in time. That's always Bridget. This is great. More of these. Love it. This is great to brainstorm. Awesome ideas. All right. Massive communication with your database.
full on emails to everyone, start sending out selected um, market value letters and preliminary CMAs to people in the hottest neighborhoods and the best price points, get strategic and get consistent, okay? All right, I will talk to you all uh, next week and keep everything going and just, you're all listing machines, okay? All right. Thank you, this is amazing. Bye-bye.